lives from just a little time to warm up. Sometimes it uh, has a little bit of lag from when it starts up. So we like to give all of our listeners time to, or viewers, I guess you could be a listener and not a viewer, uh, to settle in, get ready for some Gestalt IT rundown goodness. I've got the man Tom Hollingsworth over there on my uh, right on the video screen. I'm not going to point because it's never the way I think it is on the screen. And uh, we're going to be talking about some news, some interesting uh, policy news. It's a little bit of an international flair to some of our stories today. So excited uh, about that. And um, Tom, are you uh, you ready to get going? Yes, I'm ready to talk to all of my listeners because let's face it, who would want to look at this? This is true. Um, I, I mean, I don't look at the monitor when we record the show. <laughs> so I need to stay focused on I'd be too distracted by the 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 masculinity broadcast over the internet for me to view. It's true. It's true. All right, uh, let's get started here in three, two, one. Hello, all, and welcome to the Gestalt IT Rundown, your weekly look at the IT news of the week. I'm your host, Rich Straffolino. I'm an editor here at Gestalt IT. Joining me. From across this great nation of ours is the one, the only, the man with the plan, Tom Hollingsworth. Tom, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on, Rich. It's uh, It's been a busy week. I'm trying to talk to uh, Mr. Claus about whether or not his uh, naughty and nice list violate GDPR and CCPA. Yeah, I mean, I don't hear a lot of disclosure about what kind of information he's collecting. And I've heard he's using third-party uh, ELF data processors. So that's going to get him into mm -hmm. all sorts of trouble. Uh, yes. we've got a busy show today, Tom, lots of topics to talk about. So we're going to get started with a little something we like to call news or not. Nah. This is where we have, you know, a little too much, uh, content to give full discussions to. So we'll give you the details of the story and Tom, you will tell me if they are in fact newsy or not. First up here, the U S department of justice announced that the telecom company Ericsson, you may have heard of them, agreed to pay a $520 million criminal fine and a $540 million fine to the U S sec for conspiracy to violate the foreign corrupt practices act from 2000 to 2016. So, you know, like most of this millennium, Ericsson paid bribes to falsify books and records in China, Vietnam, and Djibouti in order to secure and keep business in those countries. Tom, Paying bribes, news or not? Um, it's not news. And I, I'm going to tell you a little secret. Uh, that's how business gets done in most of the rest of the world. There's a reason why there's a, a word for it in Arabic, bakshish. Um, bribery, whatever you want to call it, is kind of how things are done. It's just that they got caught. Okay, great. What do we do from here? Nothing. <laughs> because you know what? They're going to do it again next year. Yeah, I mean, the the report, uh, the reporting I saw, at least from Reuters, uh, went into a, a lot of detail on this. And, and not, it wasn't just that they were paying bribes, but then they were, you know, creating, this was systemic. It wasn't like some bad actors or some bad apples. This was a concerted effort to mm -hmm. do this. And it seemed to kind of indicate that as well. So uh, we will see. Maybe this mm -hmm. is a sign that the uh, SEC or the Department of Justice is taking a closer look at this. Uh, we will see if it's going forward. Mm -hmm. uh, next up here, Slack lost two cents per share in Q3 on revenue of $168.7 million dollars up 60 percent of the year for that revenue analysts had expected revenue of 156 million dollars on a loss of eight cents per share so they beat the street as the kids say the company drew grew daily active users by 20 percent in the quarter to more than 12 million users with paid users growing by 105,000 in the quarter from the last quarter for reference the latest report of microsoft teams daily active users was about 20 million although we know that there's all sorts of reasons why those numbers might be higher or whatnot so tom uh growing uh revenue growing active users 20 percent news or not here no uh, i think it's news people are still using slack um they're actually making money um, yeah, the Wall Street part's not news because quite honestly, um, you throw darts at a dartboard with Wall Street news. It's like, oh, we beat our street. No, you're going to lose money on your share price. Hey, we lost a whole ton of money this quarter. We're going to grow your share price. I don't get it. Yeah, though, the one thing that was really interesting, and it gets a little bit more of the financial angle of this, is that their operating costs grew like 67% or like 70%, something like that, um, uh, to a pretty significant amount in the quarter. So getting more expensive to operate, but still growing that revenue, still growing that. So that's what Wall Street likes to see. And I think it's important for kind of to set the narrative, at least for the company. I think that's just as important as the actual numbers. Uh, next up here, my, speaking of Microsoft Teams, Microsoft released the first port of an Office 365 app to Linux with the release of Microsoft Teams for Linux in public preview. 
Microsoft says the app will support all core Teams functionality, although some screen sharing stuff isn't working quite yet. I'm assuming just because of weird Linux internals. While not a huge install base, about 2% of the desktop market, it's notable that Microsoft never ported apps like Skype for Business to Linux. Uh, so interesting that they're doing that for Teams. Slack has a beta on Linux available for some time. So Teams joining that, news or not? Man, this is news to the three people who are using Linux on the desktop that isn't Kali, so they're not security nerds. <laughs> I, I don't even know what to say here. Congratulations, you're embracing Linux. Yay. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, will it be newsy if the rest of Office 365 makes its way over to Linux at some point? Yes, um, for a variety of reasons. Um, but yeah, basically, this this is kind of them dipping their toes in the water. All right, next up here, a leaked slide from Intel's presentation at the IEEE International Electron Devices Meeting, we all know it, uh, showed a roadmap of the company's fabrication process uh, roadmap. I think I said roadmap type, that's okay. It indicates that Intel plans to move to a new design node process every two years from now until 2029. This would see seven nanometer chips in 2021, five nanometer chips in 2023, three nanometer chips in 2025, and I saw someone speculating that'd be like a 1.4 nanometer node in 2029. This would see Intel iterate on each node every two years and release optimized processors based on that latest generation for in that two year cycle. So there'd be new process, iterate, iterate, and then simultaneously release that new node with more collaboration between design teams than in previous processor generations. Uh, design roadmap, getting real tiny transistors, news or not here, Tom? I think it's news, but not for the reason you think it is. It is um, December 11th of 2019. <laughs> <laughs> I am predicting, bold prediction, this is going to fail. And here's why. Putting it on a slide is not making it in reality. And we already know that Intel is having huge problems as they go sub 7 nanometer. 5 nanometer is problematic at best. I mean, when you look at what they have to do to keep those things from, from the yields from being down, there's no way they're going to get below 5. If they get to 3, I would be shocked. They're going to have to change the entire process. They're going to have to move away from silicon sooner or later. Um, that's the underwritten part beneath all of this that they're not really talking about. So I'm kind of curious to see when this bold slide ends up actually being, yeah, by the way, when we go from five to three and three to one, we're actually going to transition to using some kind of crazy superconductor or something like that. Yeah, and it's interesting that this wasn't a release from Intel, right? This was a private mm. meeting that the slide was leaked on. So maybe this isn't something that Intel necessarily wants the press to uh, uh, latch onto, but it's out there um, and uh, and we're seeing it. So we will be able to evaluate uh, whether we're able to hit that in, uh, we'll, we'll discuss it in uh, the 10th anniversary edition of the Gestalt IT Rundown, Tom, uh, whether they're gonna get to 1.4 nanometers. Uh, we'll still be on seven nanometers at that point. Uh, coming up here, uh, next up is, uh, speaking of uh, Electron, the open source uh, software framework Electron has a new uh, uh, home uh, in the uh, open source market there. Um, I covered up my notes, that's why I stumbled there. Originally created by GitHub in 2013, Electron has been uh, accepted into the OpenJS Foundation as part of their incubator program. This shouldn't affect current developers working on it and committing to the project. They are anticipating that will be a smooth transition. Uh, however, notable that, you know, since GitHub is now owned by Microsoft, moving to a more open -y, open source platform, I guess. Sure, why not? The apps that kill your RAM changing open source governance. News or not here, Tom? Not news. This is just <laughs> jockeying for some jockeying for a press release. I guess also maybe trying not to make open source developers mad with any weird blowback from being part of GitHub now. I don't I don't understand. Uh, and then finally here, uh, we had talked about the startup Nuvia, which was founded by a lot of big wigs from Apple's uh, chip division, kind of starting up their own uh, uh, presumably ARM processor startup. And now Apple has sued Gerard Williams, the CEO of Nuvia, claiming that the former employee broke his employee agreement while setting up this new business. Williams oversaw the design of Apple's custom uh, mobile ARM compatible processors for close to 10 years, uh, but quit earlier this year to head up Nuvia. Uh, this came out of stealth mode back in November and they're designing data center ARM chips, basically taking, I, I think the, the narrative around it was they're gonna do what Apple did for ARM chips and do for ARM in the data center, which effectively doesn't exist in a huge way right now. Don't email me about your Graviton chips. I don't care. Apple's lawsuit alleges Williams was preparing to leave Apple as part of his own business, but used iPhone uh, used phone processor designs to create his new company. 
lawyers for Apple uh, claim he also tried to lure away staff from Apple in breach of contract. So bad blood between Apple and Nuvia, company DOA on arrival, news or not? Yeah, it's news, and it's mostly because of the way that Apple's going to choose to enforce their employment agreements. Um, I, guess what? When comp when people try to go out on their own and do their own thing, yeah, they're going to take anything that's not bolted down, and they're going to try to encourage the best people that they work with uh, to come with them. And if you don't believe that, go check out uh, anything that was created by the MPLS consortium for Cisco. Um, that's literally their development model. Uh, I think what this was, was this may, there may have been some tinge in the background of this being a deal gone bad. So uh, Gerald, Gerard, Gerald, the uh, the accused, yeah, yeah. <laughs> leaving the company, maybe with a handshake deal that he's going to develop some chips that Apple's then going to buy back from him and make him stinking rich. And then Apple changing their minds or the Intel uh, modem development uh, deal. Uh, kind of crashing through his original plan. So he decides to pivot a little bit and maybe go out on his own. Apple finds out about it. Maybe they don't like that. Maybe lawyers get involved. And from that point forward, it's a big party for everybody. Yeah, this seems very weird. I mean, I, I expect this kind of story for it's uh, a lower level employee or something like that. But these were the heads of division working, uh, you know, a lot of uh, time at Apple uh, with the kind of the founding team behind Nuvia. So really weird to see this bad blood uh, cropping up. It reminds me a mm -hmm. little bit of uh, with uh, Corey Lewandowski uh, with everything that was going on with Uber's autonomous car division, kind of having that same thing with Waymo of uh, bringing uh, mm -hmm. stuff out. So we'll see if any uh, dirty laundry gets aired. We maybe get some insight into Apple's uh, chip process as a result of some disclosure. I can't wait. First up here for our main discussion story, though, uh, it wouldn't be the Gestalt AT run if we didn't talk about quantum computing, right, Tom? Uh, Intel yeah. has created a cryogenic control chip codenamed Horseridge for quantum computing. Intel Labs, Qtech, and TU Delft can use the chip to control multiple qubits. Uh, Horse Ridge is an integrated system on a chip with simplified control electronics built with Intel's 22 nanometer uh, process. It minimizes distances and cables and operates at warmer temperatures. That's really important, reducing the overall cooling challenge that quantum computing has. Right now, you basically need, I, I mean, it looks like you have a, a flux capacitor that you're cooling. There's all sorts of smoke and just giant cooling apparatuses required for even these rudimentary quantum computers that we have right now. Rather than chasing quantum supremacy, the chip is designed to achieve quantum practicality. IBM sometimes calls that quantum advantage, essentially meaning it can handle problems conventional computers can't at a faster pace, kind of maybe changing uh, the yardstick for what a successful quantum computer can be. Tom, uh, you know, we've talked about maybe some quantum skepticism about when we'll actually see this quantum computing always seems to be, it's like AI, right? It's, uh, it's always 10 years off in the distance or something like that. But, you know, the ability to reduce that cooling challenge is, is this is is this what's going to make quantum computing break through in any kind of way even on, you know on a, on a large scale or even just on an academic scale yeah i think that this is what they're going for so if you if you read the subtext um with what they're doing with this quantum what do they call it quantum advantage quantum practicality uh, they're not trying to build the ferrari of quantum computers i want to see how fast this thing can go they're building the Honda Accord of quantum computers. <laughs> I can do mundane things with less effort. I mean, let's be fair. Um, the Honda Accord is not the sexiest car ever made, but you know what it does? It reduces the costs of everything else Honda makes and it makes car driving much easier for people to do. Quantum computers are not gonna be sold as drag racers. And if you don't believe that, how many Cray XMPs do we have sitting around today? Faster, better, stronger, does not equate to usable every day. So this is a good thing because they're solving the inherent problems in quantum computing. They're not just, you know, let's build an airplane hang si hangar sized quantum computer to crack encryption. So if they want this to take off, they're going about it the right way. I just, I still have my quantum skeptic hat on right now um, because I don't, I, I, it, this, is, this is a solution in search of a problem. And I don't know what problems there are. And but we've been dealing with that in computing for 50 years. I mean, supercomputers were originally designed to predict the weather. We still can't get that right. <laughs> That's basically like every new supercomputer is like, yeah, it's going to be installed in this national laboratory and it's going to run weather simulations for the rest of time or, or also uh, ballistic mm -hmm. missile tests. So it's, you know, potato tomato. Yeah. I, I guess it's it's always interesting to me when like new exciting technology 
people start talking about ways to make it boring, which to me makes it feel more practical. Like I like yep. blockchain to me is way less interesting as like, we're going to disrupt the world currency market when it's like, uh, we're going to be able to tell if produce goes bad a lot better. Like that to me is like the sign that something is actually going to be like a thing. And mm -hmm. when, when we're talking about like, you're, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Kind of looking at like, we need, we need lots of boring quantum computers rather than you know something that can fold proteins 10 billion times faster I, I mean it'd be nice to be able to fold proteins that much faster but one that increases the amount of developers and programmers that are working on you know kind of building up the software side of quantum computing which is something that microsoft and ibm and a lot of other companies are thinking about but until you have those out in the world you're really not going to get that kind of uh i mean you can't have an install base when you have nothing installed right so boring quantum computing yeah. seems to me uh the more exciting uh, weirdly the more exciting part of it i don't know uh next forget here, folding uh, proteins if you can if you can create a, pro a quantum computer that can teach me how to fold a fitted sheet <laughs> you will have won it's called ball it up and throw it in the closet before anyone sees Tom. The Financial Times reports that a new order from the Chinese Communist Party's central office, my favorite central office, calls for the removal of all foreign computer equipment and software from government offices and public institutions within three years. Analysts at China Securities estimated this would affect between 20 to 30 million pieces of hardware, I guess in a company or in a in a country of almost 2 billion people that doesn't seem like the most computers but still a lot with an estimated 30 percent replaced in 2020 50 percent in 2021 20 percent in 2022 so kind of taking the bulk of that uh, within the first two years chinese cybersecurity firms say the order will not allow the use of uh, the version of windows 10 that was co-developed with the chinese government and points to the difficulties of replacing software with domestic alternatives in that short of a window it's also unclear if domestic Chinese companies like Lenovo, uh, which make you know all the laptops, will be able to use foreign source components, things from hard drives from Samsung or Intel processors, that kind of stuff. So, Tom, uh, you know, we, we've seen a lot of big tech kind of turn inwards. A lot of it's because of you know the the kind of the ongoing trade war between China and the U.S. But do you think this is going to have larger impacts? And will we will we actually see this, or is this a threat? to, hey, uh, every OEM that has installed in Chinese government offices, um, we're going to do this unless there's some unspoken agreement that this is kind of pointing a way toward. This is absolutely not a threat. This is the direction that the Chinese government wants to go. I wrote a blog post about this uh, a couple of weeks ago regarding um, some of the challenges that uh, SD-WAN providers are seeing because China has mandated now that no encryption can exist inside of Chinese uh, controlled territory. So no more VPNs, uh, none of that. And you know, when you think about SD-WAN, it's literally built on IPsec VPNs. Um, this is a fundamental shift in Chinese policy and it twofold. One, we are going to dictate to you what you can do, which they can do that, because of their government. Um, the second thing is they are basically saying to all foreign investors, we don't want to play ball anymore. Like, like if, if this was a thing where they were trying to get favorable terms or something like that, yeah. um, I could totally see this being a threat. You know, hey, pay us, you know, uh, we will only charge you, you know, half as much and, and you can keep our stuff. No, this is a fundamental shift. And I fully expect that what we're going to start seeing is more and more Chinese companies ramping up production of devices to meet these needs and China essentially kind of becoming Ouroboros and eating its own tail with regards to this and shutting large companies out of their market. Um, I think it's definitely a political consideration uh, and anyone who says differently is lying to you. Um, but this is not a political consideration trying to curry favor. This is the Chinese looking forward five years and going, we have a real opportunity to dictate terms to the rest of the world, and we're going to do it. Is this the Chinese government basically dog fooding this, uh, you know, in terms of like, all right, we can't tell everyone in the country to get rid of every foreign made computer and every foreign made piece of software, but we can swallow, you know, we can take that pain and pay for that to make it go away. Do that investment in things like operating systems, basic productivity software, web browsers, that kind of, I mean, I know they have web browsers and stuff like that. That's not as important as the operating system level, but it, take that pain and then uh, you know, in 10 years, let's say, have, you know, uh, start rolling this out on a on a wider basis outside of just government offices? 
it won't be even 10 years. It'll be less than that. I, I, I bet five years. Um, so th that's why they're piloting this to government offices and, and basically anything that's government funded. Because, yeah, they can absolutely dictate to do that. We could do that, too. Uh, now, the, the government would get their pants suit off <laughs> if they tried it. But but the the difference is, is the two government types, one of them allows you for fiat rule. Um, <laughs> and and yeah, basically what they're doing, because stage two of this is, OK, um, we've rolled this out to all of the government uh, agencies. If you're going to interface with one of these agencies for any reason, you have to be using one of these devices. Surprise. Everybody has to interface with the government at some point. And speaking with the government that we interface with, Bloomberg reports that the U.S. Federal Trade Commission has broadened its antitrust investigation of Amazon to include Amazon Web Services, according to sources. Previously, they had been looking exclusively at Amazon's retail operations. Uh, no surprise here, Gartner estimates that AWS holds 48% of the public cloud market. Some would say that's maybe a little conservative. Uh, and uh, it, uh, over the past 12 months, it's rep uh, AWS has represented 60% of Amazon's operating income. So it's a huge part of their business, uh, especially when it comes to profitability and, and things like that. One issue the FTC could investigate is whether Amazon discriminates against third parties that offer services running on top of several cloud providers rather than AWS exclusively. We've seen Amazon, uh, you know, kind of rumoring that they have had some issues with the government over not getting the Jedi contract now, now having the US FTC looking closely at their cloud business. How worried should Amazon be about this time? That depends on what Jeff Bezos thinks. If Jeff Bezos <laughs> thinks that this is just them trying to clear the air about Amazon being non-competitive, yeah, come on, investigate me, do your best. If this is Jeff Bezos thinking that the US government is lodging a grudge against him and just looking for problems, yeah, I'd be standing on top of my Blue Origin rocket and screaming <laughs> at anybody that can hear. Um, here, here's the deal, and ultimately this is the problem. Um, this is not Microsoft in the 90s, where basically you had to run an OS from Microsoft and 90% of the people ran an office suite uh, from those folks. I mean, look how Microsoft came out of that. And they were, you know, we were literally talking about breaking Microsoft apart at one point. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, guess what? You don't like AWS? Move to another cloud. You can go to Azure. I mean, there are services out there that will port your workloads. You can go to GCP something, something Oracle cloud joke here. Um, <laughs> the problem right. is you're going to have a really, really hard time selling anyone on the fact that I can not pick up my workloads. I mean, what you're okay. You're using Glacier. So yeah, it's going to cost you a small fortune, but I'm not forcing you to stay in AWS. Mm -hmm. I think that this is the U S government looking for a reason to kind of, um, to, uh, bring to heal the leader. Um, and you know, if I was Jeff Bezos, honestly, Jeffrey, I know you're listening. Love you, buddy. I would fire back with every dollar I could about the Jedi contract, about all of the crap that's being said about you in the press by the leader of the government investigating you. Make it hurt. Make them sh show to everybody exactly what's going on. I mean, God, what are you going to do? Spend your money on going to Mars? Nah. <laughs> nah, ruin some people's lives. Come on, man. I, Larry you know, would do it. <laughs> Larry wishes uh, that someone would would say that he had a monopoly on the public cloud market so he could fire back at them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, this is, uh, I, on the one hand, yes, it is a little worrisome that it seems like, you know, there is some personal beef d dictating, you know, maybe like the, the way the government interfaces with this private company. But I also think this is part of a large, you know, because I, I at least I don't right now look at the FTC necessarily as a partisan institution. Maybe it's me being naive or something like that. Um, but but I do think this is part of a larger skepticism and a larger narrative uh, looking at how we've unquestionably just let Amazon, you know, Amazon provides it cheap and pretty good. And so we'll let them do whatever we want. And I think definitely on the retail side and maybe increasingly on the cloud side, especially, like I said, with that focus on, you know, whether they're preferencing exclusive third parties versus third parties that are working with everybody. That to me is something I do want to know if if Amazon's, you know, kind of being a jerk about that. So it will be interesting to see what comes out. So of I'll. I'll be honest. The only thing the government should be investigating about Amazon is why they're not paying their taxes. Like that literally is the only thing here. If you don't like the fact that Amazon's kicking your butt in cloud and retail, beat them. <laughs> Get better. 
All right, next up here. And finally, uh, an interesting news coming out of India. They've proposed major data regulation, somewhat akin to GDPR, although there's some interesting exceptions, creatively called Persona Data Protection Bill 2019. Uh, this would require companies operating in the country to get consumer consent before collecting and processing personal data. Sounds pretty familiar. It also calls for companies to hand over non-personal data on users to the Indian government and exempts the government from those same consent laws. <laughs> the bill also has a proposed rule aimed at social networks uh, with interactions of more than two people, uh, allowing users to give the option to verify their identities and then publicly display that verification, kind of akin to the Twitter blue checkmark, uh, and basically saying like people should be able to prove that they are, they say who they are if they want that. The bill has been in development for more than two years and is expected to be debated in Parliament in the coming weeks. Are we better prepared for these types of regulations in a post GDPR and upcoming post CCP world, or does this pose new challenges for organizations here, Tom? This is a huge challenge for people. And look at the fact that you just named, well, this one, GDPR, CCPA, and all three of them do something completely different from a different perspective. And I, I, I'm sorry, Google tried the real name thing on YouTube once. And I think we all remember the disaster that was. <laughs> And that wasn't even like a legal thing. That was just them trying to sell more Google Plus. Um, yeah. This ultimately, the problem is, is that everybody's going to have their own perspective. The Chinese data protection law is going to look way different than the Indian protection law is going to look way different than, I don't know, the Argentinian data protection law. But they all have to have a lot of things in common. Otherwise, we're going to just get into a regulation nightmare. And ultimately, I think this has to carry some strong debate. And unfortunately, the people who are debating it still wishes they could use a jitterbug flip phone. <laughs> Most of the people who are debating these problems are not tech savvy enough to understand the, the, the challenges of it. I mean, look at the, the law that you just read off. Social networks, which are things that involve conversations with more than two people. Well, I guess technically that means my iMessage group chat falls under this privacy law. Yeah, it, it, it becomes, I, I mean... On the one hand, I guess what I'm getting at with GDPR, yes, there was the challenge of meeting like thing challenges like meeting the right to be forgotten, the challenge of you know knowing who's processing your data and stuff like that. But I, I think it might have been short sighted if organizations were only approaching that from the perspective of we're gonna uh, you know redo our data policy over these next three years so that we can meet this specific regulation as opposed to. Uh, setting up more transparent and accountable data policies going forward so that regardless of what regulation is coming down the pipe, as long as it's, you know, not like just open a pipe to the government and let them suck all the data out, non-personal user information sounds really creepy to me. Um, but I, I, my hope would be with things like GDPR and CCPA that it's motivating organizations to not craft uh, regulation specific data policies and, and data readiness strategies rather to, to set up frameworks that are adaptable, transparent. And so like, I mean, like the basic challenges, if you talk to um, like a friend of ours, Karen Lopez, right? She always talks about like the, the data governance is the fundamental problem with all of this. It's like literally like knowing what you have, what you're collecting and what the risk associated with collecting that data is. Are like, if you can answer those three questions, you are probably in a good position to meet whatever these data regulations are going to be. I'm not saying those are easy questions to answer, especially if you're a legacy organization, but I, I guess my hopes are that people aren't just being like, all right, we're going to slap a data policy band for GDPR and CCPA, and now we got to do this uh, personal data protection bill 2019, which is the best name ever for a bill. Uh, so I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm maybe optimistic that people are being forward thinking with their data policy as opposed to reactive to these kind of regulations. Oh, Rich, you sweet summer child, <laughs> hoping that organizations are going to do what's good for people as opposed to the absolute minimum letter of the law they need to do to not get fined. Hey, yeah. I completely agree. If more companies were like REI in Patagonia, the world would be a better place. Unfortunately, they're not. And we're stuck with this. So we're going to have to write regulations that force companies to do the right thing. And we need to encourage people who believe that getting rid of all regulations is a good thing to understand how stupid an idea that really is. Well, what's what's funny to me is that some of the talk around GDPR back, in, you know, a couple of years ago was like, oh, I guess we're just we're not going to be able to do any business in Europe anymore because we just can't possibly comply to this. Mm -hmm. and now it's like, OK, now we can't do business in Europe. 
Now we can't do business in California and, and also by extension to most of the United States and India. So I guess, uh, Mongolia. Yeah. <laughs> if you got Mongolia as your key market, you can do business in congratulations. Nailed it. Uh, but that just about brings us to the end of the Gestalt IT Rundown. Tom, thank you for a wonderful conversation. As always, hope uh, our, our viewers and listeners found that informative. Where can people find more of your great stuff if they're so inclined? No, at this point, man, just Google me. Um, uh, the best thing to do, although, is the most of the content I've been writing has been coming out on our website at gestaltit.com. I've been covering a lot of the events that have been going on throughout 2019, uh, some exclusive posts, especially some stuff coming out about River, I'm um, sorry, uh, reInvent. Um, but you definitely don't want to miss some of that. Uh, we've got more great stuff coming your way in the coming year. Um, it should be a fun time. Yeah, uh, gestaltit.com. You can find podcasts. You can find uh, past episodes of The Rundown there. All sorts of good stuff there. You can find me on Twitter at Mr. Anthropology. And you may want to keep an eye out for that. Uh, speaking of kind of data readiness and Karen Lopez, uh, funnily enough, uh, we're planning on doing a webinar for Commvault all about data readiness, kind of talking a little a part of that being kind of this compliance question and that kind of that, uh, like I said, in uh, in partnership with Commvault. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, I'm, we're still trying to nail down the exact uh, date for the webinar, but uh, we have all the material ready. So it's going to be really good. And we kind of talk specifically to that. So very good times for that as well. We'll be back next Wednesday at 12.30 p.m. Eastern time talking about the IT news of the week. Next week, we're going to be doing our year in review, kind of what the biggest stories are. I think uh, maybe some uh, Amazon news uh, might be some of the biggest news uh, of the year. Uh, so check that out. And then we will be off for the rest of the year after that. And we'll see you in 2020. But join us next week for our best of or the biggest news of 2019. Until then, everybody, remember, have a super sparkly day.